Oh, oh shit, it started recording. Okay. <laughs> hey, welcome to Chelsea Conversations. I'm your host, Logan McGaha. And I'm Red Lundy, also your host. And we're uh, trying something new now. We're going to add a video element to this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're going to try a video. Um, hopefully you guys don't hate us. Yeah, I mean, I don't care if they hate us. I'm... Yeah, I'm comfortable with that, too. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, no, uh, this, this is just a test. We're going to try to actually see about, you know, um, maybe upgrading our video equipment, but, you know, we, we wanted the people to feel closer to us. Yeah, I mean, you guys, you know, might come into the gym or something like that or see us out at the crag and want to say hi, and now you know what we, now, now you know what we look like, so. Yeah, and I, and I think, uh, you know, for URA coming up next month, uh, this gives people a chance to see our face and come up and interact with us. Yeah, totally. Well, at least I hope so. Um, I hope it encourages any climbers to, to come in and talk to us because that's kind of what we're here for is to meet and talk with all sorts of climbers from all over. So Yeah, 100%. I mean, and plus it's going to be fun. It's going to be URA. We're going to be drinking and dancing and ice climbing and podcasting and yeah, I mean, probably drinking some more and <laughs> drinking a lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that's going to be a lot of fun. I mean, it's cold, you know, you got to stay warm. Yeah, nothing gets the blood circulating like a good blood thinner. Yeah, like liquor. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Sponsored by your local bottle. <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, if any if anyone out there saw some of our recent posts, we've started training for URA, um, got some nice videos on the Instagram. Yeah, we don't really know what we're doing, but uh, we're just throwing the axes on some on some wood uh, where the hangboards are and just doing some like figure four sort of stuff, some so some core intensive things, uh, some pull-ups, just trying to get our bodies used to pulling on the tools and not rock or plastic. Yeah. Uh, our, <clears throat> my, I don't know about you, but my body fucking hates me for this. Yeah, no, my back is killing me right now. Yes, 100%. Yeah, totally. So, I mean, luckily we've had a few beers. I feel like without that, I would be in significantly more pain. Oh yeah, no. Uh, I, I I think before the beers, I, I was I was ready to kill myself. No, oh yeah, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I am totally just kidding right there. Yeah, don't take us too seriously, or do? No, I'm just kidding. Don't take us too seriously. We are uh, we're funny guys, or we like to think so. We like to joke around. Um, so let's get started. Um, so yes. we've got some some news in climbing um, this week, and. Uh, some of that is really revolving around women in the trad scene. Heck yeah. Something you don't really hear about a lot. I mean, yeah, I mean, you know, I think female climbers are coming uh, into attention a, a lot more in climbing. I think they always, I, honestly, I think they always were. Um, I think climbers generally as people are, are pretty fair people. Um, hopefully you guys don't disagree with that, but um, it's, it's good to see, women pushing trad and pushing the limits of trad, um, not just for women, but for the sake of that style of climbing. And so to highlight um, a couple climbers, we can start with uh, Brittany Gorris. I hope I'm pronouncing that, that last name correctly. And she is pretty hardcore, just climbed, what was it, 513C? I think that is what it is. I'm yeah, 513C. Um, yeah, the Todd Skinner test piece at crack test piece crack city park yeah city park so um from what i understand it was just obscenely difficult crack climbing i read a little bit about her um and she has gone from a pretty severe debilitating injury i think to her back and she came back from that and recovered and started climbing 514 sport like really difficult 513 trad um she's just like really coming to her own as a crack climber whereas before i believe she was mostly a bouldering gal okay yeah um so explain to the audience a little bit about trad climbing because it, it, it's kind of different than um you know regular sport or lead climbing yeah so trad you're placing your gear on the wall so there's not uh fixed gear um, so you're using a combination usually of cams, hexes, uh, nuts, um, which hexes and nuts are just stoppers. Um, the cams are actually creating friction with the rock and locking into the crack. Um, so it's sort of like a retracting gear um, and you pinch it, you pitch the gear to uh, contract it and then you place it into the crack and then you release it to retract it and it catches on the rock and, and it's supposed to hold your weight. Um, 
so similar to a bolt, so that it has a, a quick draw on the end of it, and you clip into that. So, like you say, it like it just basically has a metal it cable expands yeah. into the rock, and so that like acts as a stopper pulling it. Correct, and it's got it's it literally looks kind of like a gear. It's got serrated edges that catch on the rock, um, and it's got a metal cable loop um, that's at the end of the pinch section, and then you clip a draw into that metal cable loop. So it's it's like a D ring on a on a gear, kind of. But instead of being aluminum, it's cable. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that's um so that and they come in various sizes to cams that are you know teeny teeny tiny like half an inch in diameter to I, I've seen the big ones yeah like they're, yeah those are insane yeah they're just gigantic like bigger than your head like yeah. just massive cams uh, and those are super super expensive <laughs> as all yeah, trad racks are but I I feel like if you're gonna buy something that big like you know. You'd be better off just getting the off the crack line. <laughs> yeah, I mean that's what you know, they're pretty much used for. I think just is, is jam for, your body in yeah. there and just shimmy your way up. Yeah, yeah. I mean, or you could go like old school Yosemite and like take just rocks and just throw a sling around them and just jam it into a, a crack. And hey, maybe that'll hold your weight. I don't know. I've seen. I mean, I've seen it done, so it's, it looks really sketchy. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Which brings us kind of to our uh, next topic. Who else do we have in the, in the world of female crack climbing? Uh, Hazel Finley. Hazel Finley. Shout out. What up, bro? Man, Hazel has been crushing it. What was the grade she just climbed? Uh, 514C. That was what? Magic Trick? Is that the name? Uh, magic Line. Magic Line. 514C yeah. Trad. Ooh, that's rough. Yeah, the first time I really uh, got into Hazel Finley's climbing is I saw her in that uh, Alex Honnold documentary where yeah. he was in South Africa. Yeah, totally. Dude, she is. She crushes. She crushes hardcore. Yeah, yeah. She she puts us all to shame, um, especially in trad. I mean, this is like a finger splitter, like really difficult trad line. Uh, I think first climbed with, with them placing their own gear was Ron Kalk from the Stone Masters, I believe, generation in Yosemite. Yeah. And he first climbed it. Um, and according to Hazel, uh, in an article by Rock and Ice, she said that he cemented uh, holds because the, the feet are so bad on this line that he had to basically make his own, which is a whole, whole other topic we'll get into. Uh, but his son, Lonnie Kalk, also climbed it, placing his own gear. Um, and then third up is Hazel Finley very recently climbed it and just absolutely crushed it. Heck yeah. I mean, she's, uh, she's coming out of the UK. So, I mean, there, there's a big trad culture already in the UK. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. There's a huge trad culture in, in the UK. And, and to be honest with you, they're really sketchy trad culture in the UK. Yeah. Because that rock is like, <laughs> like, uh, some of the stuff you watch with that rock, it, it's covered in water. It's wet. Yeah, and it's yeah. Like slick, like over. Damn, it's a human environment they're in. Low hanging clouds. It looks really, really sketchy. Um, and uh, from what I understand, a lot of those really hard trad lines in the UK are pretty run out. So um, that adds a whole nother level to it. And and so I think the UK climbers um, hold themselves to a, a slightly higher standard in terms of the intensity to which they trad climb, but not necessarily the big wall trad style that we see here in the, in the U.S. with, the, with Yosemite. Okay, well. so uh, let's let's take a step back for a second. Yep. Uh, explain to the audience uh, when you say run out, like exactly what you mean. So run out um, means that you have climbed so far past your last gear placement that you effectively deck or dab on the ground. So uh, run out means you're you're climbing pretty typical style, clipping every once in a while, making sure you're placing protection. Um, when you run out, you run out of a place to place protection, and you run out past that safe fall zone where you can fall, get a nice soft catch, and, and hit the wall, um, and instead you're actually effectively free soloing with gear. Um, and we actually... Uh, we had a friend who recently run out um, on trad, and he decked from, I think, 35, 40 feet. Um, completely shattered his arm, um, tore up his leg pretty bad. He, su he survived. He, did, he actually didn't damage his back, which is phenomenal. Um, yeah, that's, that's incredible when you hear that. 
Yeah, I don't know how. Some people just get really lucky when they fall. Um, and he, he was climbing and as, as a lot of places in Tennessee. The sport climbing and track climbing uh, belay areas are pretty rough. Jagged boulders everywhere. The landings are, are gnarly. They're not, they're not like full of grass and plowed fields. <clears throat> so yeah, run out, run out's um, it's a big thing in the UK um, from what I've seen in in trad climbing and, and videos and documentaries and such and uh, and those 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 climbers are they're pretty intense. So Hazel is cut from a very particular cloth. Yeah, uh, wasn't her father like a climber? Like that's how she got into it. I think. Uh, I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not sure. I don't know too much about Hazel's uh, background in climbing and how she came into it. Um, but regardless of, of what started her on that path, she has excelled yeah. um, to the highest levels of, of drag climbing. <clears throat> and to go back to Brittany Gora, she, um, she also had climbed a 512B, I believe. I'm not sure where it was, but it was commented by Alex Honnold that it was the hardest 512B he'd ever, he'd ever crack climbed. It was extremely difficult and probably a little sandbag, so... Um, yeah, these are these are two gals that are really paving the way in crack climbing and, and trad climbing in general. So keep an eye out for them because they're killing it right now. And you know, if Honnold's saying something's hard, it's pretty fucking hard. Yeah, I mean, if Honnold's, yeah, I mean, especially because that's kind of like his mo. I mean, what was that in El Cap? They said like two thousand feet of a single crack, yeah. a free rider, and he soloed that with no rest. Yeah, I mean. <laughs> yeah, he's an authority. Yeah, if he's saying. And who was that guy that uh, that was in that UK documentary we watched? Uh, um, James. Uh, was it James Pearson? I think it was James Pearson. Yeah, that let sounds me, right. Yeah, let me pull it up here real quick. Yeah, he was. Um, yeah, Logan will check out that name just to just to be sure. But he's a. Uh, he was kind of in this documentary, which is on Hulu. Um, he was, uh, is a really good, um, trad climber, climbs a lot of runouts, and he kind of made a name for himself in the UK of climbing these relatively short, but really sketchy, dangerous runout, hard, hard trad lines. Um, started climbing all of the hardest stuff, uh, in the UK, and basically made his way, uh, into creating new grades. Um, I think he created two or three new hard grades in trad, or at least claimed to. Um, Alex Honnold and Brad Gobright came over to the UK on a sponsored trip. Uh, Brad Gobright, RIP. We've discussed him a lot. And they came over to try these new hard lines that James had set. And they crushed them very easily, downgraded them hardcore they they weren't trying to be mean or anything they were just saying hey you know this is not the grade you know we we climb these in like one session um you know you're you're basically just not accurate at all and he got completely blasted by the uk trad scene had to i don't think he had to but he chose to leave the uk for a while went away into a hidey hole and just reevaluated himself as a climber and what what climbing meant to him and he's come back as a pretty strong force in trad climbing yeah, it's uh, James Pearson, um, the documentary, if you really want to watch it, it's really great. I recommend it. It's um, Redemption, the James Pearson story. <clears throat> yeah, so yeah, he, uh, he, really, he really got affected by the community um, just coming after him for basically saying that he was the greatest trad climber in the world and then got all of his new hard trad lines shut down in one session by, you know, Alex Honnold and Brad Gobright. And I think that goes to show that um, in the climbing community, until you prove yourself, you can't have that uh, hubris of saying that I am the greatest. Yeah, and, and from, I believe in the documentary, he basically only trad climbed in the UK, so he didn't have a lot of exposure to other styles of trad. Mm -hmm. And when you don't have that exposure to different styles, I don't think you should really have the right to start laying down the hardest grades and treads. You need to get out, you know. You need to go to Yosemite. Yeah. You need to you need to go you need to go to Indian Creek and experience some really hard trad before you start making these these blanket statements. Yeah, because I mean he was laying down new grades and they were like his big projects and they would they wouldn't take him that long to get. So you got to kind of wonder, well, 
if it's supposed to be the new hard grade in track climbing, don't you think it would be like a long process of establishing that and double checking and making sure? And if it's that hard, don't you think it would take you a really long time to climb it? Yeah. But I think his ego got to him and he was just, he was just climbing really well and he was young and he didn't have anybody correct him. And yeah, exactly. I mean, I think it just, <clears throat> it comes down to age in that, you know, one, that, the age of being like being young and wanting to be the best. Right. Yeah. And you you set yourself up and then you take that fall. Yeah, and it's a question it really is a question of ethics and what climbers value. And I think he valued his own success and the fact that he was so young and no one was really saying anything about it. And he valued it so much that he was willing to risk his reputation on that and then it got completely squashed. Um, and that that set of ethics that climbers have in communities around the world, uh, it's it's unquestionable. Uh, which kind of brings up the point of Hazel Finley's climb, where she, you know, she was saying Ron Calc cemented holes into the wall, and she uh, claims that she, or she believes, not claims, but she believes that she broke off the very last of those cemented holes, and she still sent it, which is amazing. So, so basically. Ron Kalk and Lonnie Kalk had climbed this untrue to its nature. And she is not just the first woman, she's the first person to climb that completely true to its nature, which is significantly harder. And she even states in, in that interview with Rock and Ice, you know, this is a different route than what Ron Kalk climbed. Because these holds have, have broken off over time and there's nowhere to put your feet. Absolutely. Not. I mean, all the feet are just they, just, they don't stick at all. So it's really impressive that she was able to climb it. I think it uh, it comes down to being great in your technique and then having the trust and confidence in your body. Yeah. Yeah, trusting that you know that you're placing your, <clears throat> your toe on the wall and you know that it's not going to go anywhere. Yeah, and yeah, trusting your feet, that's such an important part of climbing. I feel like when you're track climbing, that's really, really important because, you know, there's no guarantee that when you clip into that piece of protection that it is going to hold like, a brand new bolt will yeah. and technically there's no guarantee that that bolt's going to hold either but this the likelihood of it holding is significantly higher because it's you know, bolted into a solid rock face and probably by somebody who at least on some part knew what they were doing yeah and you know placing your own protection is all about your judgment call and how you place it and, and you just have to know what you're doing yeah and i think that comes with you know experience in climbing you know, I've, I've never been track climbing. And no, no, me neither. No, I'll, I'm free to admit that I've never been, been climbing for a long time. Never been track climbing. I think I think it's interesting. I want to learn how. Yeah. Oh, I'd love to learn how. I it's it's really it's expensive to build your own rack. It's not something that I've I have really wanted to take out the time and money and resources to do. Yeah. And yet, yet, yeah, I'm changing. That I'm I'm becoming the way <laughs> that I want to start doing that, and that's mostly just the adventure side of me starting to come out a little bit more instead of just the sport athleticism, pulling really hard moves, being a really strong climber. And now I'm kind of wanting to branch off into other, and I think and I think I can speak for you that that's true for you as well. Yeah, I mean, uh, right now uh, my focus is, uh, it, it's honestly on URA right now, getting, and yeah, I'm like. I'm shifting out of rock season. Yeah, get, getting really just wanting to be on the ice. I mean, we may live in Tennessee, but we are all about the ice right now, and it's mostly just like kind of a new frontier. I've ice climbed a little bit, um, and this will be my third time ice climbing. This will be Logan's first, so we're basically at the same knowledge level starting off of, of the mechanics of everything. And you know, I think we're gonna we'll probably sign up for some clinics or something to learn some more advanced stuff. Maybe learn, you know, maybe learn how to lead ice and place yeah. our own screws and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's on my goal list right now. Um, I, I've looked at ice climbing, and I think it it's just a totally different, you know, beast to to conquer. But um, beyond that, I'm looking towards, uh, you know, in my horizon, I'm seeing mountains, like big mountains. Like Absolutely. That that that's what I want to get to. Absolutely, and ice climbing is a great step for that because mm -hmm. you can start learning the movement and the technical skills. Yeah. Surrounded around those big mountain ascents. Um, yeah, no, my, my horizons are definitely set on that as well. Um, and, and 
uh, I'm completely satisfied with rock and I love rock climbing and I will continue to rock climb forever. But uh, yeah, mountains are kind of becoming the bigger focus, especially as we start, you know, I've been traveling out of Tennessee for a while, but it's, it's going to be nice to have Logan out there and we're going to get on the West and really experience that together and hopefully build some experiences together. And we'll go see Joe. Yeah. Yep. We'll go see Joe and my climbing partner from, from Spain. And he lives out in Des Moines, Iowa right now. And shout out Joe. I don't think I have I given him a shout out yet. Maybe I did. I don't, I don't think you have. I don't think you have given Joe a shout out. I don't know. I feel like I talk about him a lot because I talk to him every day. But uh, I, I think you just talk about him to me, like in, yeah, in our day to day conversation. Totally. Yeah. I mean, I'm talking to the guy every day. He's he's a, a fan of the podcast and and he's a really good friend of mine, longtime climbing partner, and uh, we're really excited to see him. And we'll have a podcast episode with him. So stay tuned for that. Like, yeah. In about a month and a half, and we're getting going. Exactly. So, yeah. Um, no, I like I said, those, that's on my horizon. Like, I really want to hit those big mountains. But I, I also learned uh, this weekend, uh, we went to King's Bluff to do some sport climbing. Yep. And, and I learned a lot that, you know. That's in Clarksville, Tennessee. Yeah, Clarksville, Tennessee, oh, guys, King's yeah. Bluff. Beautiful, scenic climbing, just exposed rock on the Cyber River. Yeah, it gets it gets just crapped on by a ton of people. Yeah, I, I don't understand why. I was like, this is amazing. I, I could yeah. easily come here and climb like. All I the mean, time. this this is gonna offend some people, I'm sure, probably a lot of locals. But uh, Kings Bluff, I think, is some really great climbing, and I think if you really hate Kings Bluff for climbing because it gets a lot of views and it sits in the sun, then you probably don't love climbing as much as you say you do. I didn't see anything wrong with it, and that was my first time there. Mm -hmm. So I mean, I don't know. Maybe after hundred and fifty thousand times climbing it, I might start nitpicking it. But yeah, I mean, our friends, our friends Andrew and Christy, I think said it best. The nice thing about Kings is you can touch on so much rock when you go out there, and that's a great way to put it because every route is basically perfectly, perfectly spaced. There's not really any overlap, but there's so much climbing. And, and I like there. the fact the uh, SEC came, has came in and attached name plates and grades to the routes. Yeah, they've been maintaining that for quite some time, and they've done a really good job of maintaining the bolts there and oh, the yeah, name like, plates. And you don't really need a guidebook to figure your way around Kings. It's very, no. it's very intuitive. No, I, I like the fact that like we walked up to a wall and you could see the sun shining off the metal of a, of a D ring and it looked just so brand new and shiny. Yeah, and, and it made me feel comfortable. Totally. I mean, I know sometimes like we talk about the adventure of rock climbing is making yourself feel uncomfortable doing something, but I, I think especially getting new people into the sport, having that comfort comfortability level is you know an amazing thing to have. Yeah, and it's um it. To, to be comfortable on the rock for the first uh, several times that you're getting used to sport climbing, particularly, it's, it's really important. And then once you start getting used to the systems of how it works, uh, branching out into uncomfortable territory is really good for the headspace. And as long as you've got a partner that can help keep you within that safety margin, you know, even if it is, even if it is just basic sport, that's not super dangerous. You know, it, it's still, it still is. And you just, you have to be able to rely on your partner. And if they're doing their job to keep you safe, then you can really push your mindset and that sort of that sketch factor that comes along with branching into new territory and sport climbing. Yeah. Um, it, it showed me that, you know, I, I've been climbing for about three years. Um, my, Gym climbing technique has really suffered because I power through a lot of things. And so uh, one of the things I had to learn is, and I actually figured it out at King's Bluff this weekend, is I need to warm up, you know, doing light traverses across the bottom of the rock if there's no one around. And just getting myself <clears throat> comfortable with placing my feet and trusting that, you know, my, my foot isn't going to go, you know, just greasing off if I put weight on it. Absolutely. Because I think when I get outside, uh, one, one of the things that, like that is one of the things that um, really just gets in my head. Yeah. Is I'll have amazing handholds, whether it be like these really gigantic crimps, even, you know, going into jug territory, mm -hmm. pockets, anything. I can have the best hands in the world, but I have a hard time figuring out my feet on real rock. Absolutely. 
And, and you know, and I don't want to be like that. You know, I want to be comfortable. And it's really hard to figure out your feet at Kings too. I yeah. Mean, just, I mean, if we're talking about Kings Bluff, I gotta tell you, it's pretty hard. It's it's really slabby. A lot of the chalk just gets washed off. Um, it does get pretty greasy. What that's kind of how that's kind of what I like about it is it's it's a new sort of climbing and yeah it's it's kind of rough but I I don't know I like it I don't love perfect conditions I'm not a fair weather climber man no I I like trying you know things when I just when everything else feels lost yes yeah absolutely yeah I mean man climbing in really sketchy weather or under under really freaky conditions I don't know I just Maybe there's something wrong with me. Maybe there's something wrong with you. I don't know, but I love that stuff. I know I've been bouldering with Joe. There's this one spot in Iowa called Picture Rocks, and it's got some sport climbing, and then there's also this uh, boulder that we've we've uh, sort of tried to develop in this um, sort of cavernous area. Um, and we've been out there climbing in like, God, I don't know, 15 degrees, snowing, and it's like, probably 15 20 degrees colder in the cave so and it's it's that that cave just for preface for any of you if you any of you have climbed there that cave has been closed before for white nose syndrome for bats to, for people to access it however you are allowed to access it with a permit where we are climbing is not actually in the cave it is in the mouth of the cave there is no harm to those bats where we climb um, and we are really respectful of that territory. So please don't jump our guns here um, and start calling me out about climbing there. It's, it's we're, We are aware and we are very careful um, and making sure that we're following those rules. But the, but the climbing there was just, I mean, so cold. And I don't know, it's just something, just something about climbing in harsh conditions. I just love it. I absolutely love it. I don't, fair weather's nice and all, but I don't know, there's no... There's no adventure to that. I think I think my favorite thing that I've done so far in the sport of climbing is, and I've only got to do it one time, but I love it, is night climbing. Oh yeah, so much fun. You know, uh, it, it's completely different than from when you go to a, from a late night climb in the gym to an actual outside night climbing session. Yeah. Um, we went to Short Mountain, which has you know just been opened up fairly recently again, mm -hmm. and you know. I felt like it's a pretty um, under the radar place so understand the rules and, and learn about the place if you're gonna go out there and respect it and try not to um, overwhelm it with yes. with your presence but it is in it is a really cool place it's been climbed in a lot Jimmy Webb actually uh, went there uh, and put up a lot of the really hard first ascents there um, it's yeah it's neat so what do you what do you think about night climbing? What did you experience? Uh, so going into it, I didn't really know what to expect. I, I was kind of, you know, I don't know if I told you this, but I was a little nervous about it. At sure. First. Yeah. yeah, it's night climbing. Yeah, Outside, yeah I didn't, I didn't freaky, know what you know? you know. I didn't really know what to expect. Um, you know, I, I I was thinking about it as some of the these places like you know LRC uh, where they have rules. You know, they're closed at certain times. You know, it never really clicked to me that, you know, a lot of these places aren't like that. You can go anytime you want. Right. And so I, I was a little nervous on the hike end thing, and we were constantly going to, like, someone was going to, like, you know, start shining a flashlight at us and saying, hey, yeah, get out of here. Get off this property and all that. Yeah. yeah. Or, or, you know, we're in Tennessee, so shotguns. Yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah. That's so true. Down here in Tennessee, if any of you are not from the South, man, be careful. If you are trying to get on some rock that you've heard about on private land, be very careful. Be, be people respectful. may shoot you. <laughs> be, be very respectful. Yes. I mean, if, you, if, you, if you find somewhere that you've heard about and it's private property, talk to the owner because while they might shoot you, nine times out of ten, Southerners are very hospitable and they're very... They are open and welcoming to you know as long as you're being respectful to their land absolutely you got to go through the proper channels you don't want to just roll up come some complete stranger in the middle of the night on someone's private property and then have them catch you because that could get dicey yes. but you know be respectful uh talk to them you know their southern hospitality is a real thing mm -hmm. it's not a myth people are really nice down here yeah but they're also can be very violent <laughs> oh yeah no uh <laughs> but yeah, like I, I was expecting like a 
a multitude of variables to go wrong. And then we hike in and it like there was areas where, you know, it was muddy, very rutted from horse trails. And yeah, this big horse trail that's basically the hiking trail. It's yeah, super deep mud. You can just like accidentally slip your foot off a rock and you're just like way past your ankle, just solid mud. Yeah. I mean, I think we got like all kinds of mud and stuff on the pads and everything. Yeah, was, everything was super dirty. Yeah, and it's hard to see. Yeah. But we got in, we found uh, this kind of overhung cave area, climbed on it, like found some really cool routes. I yeah, mean, totally. Just throwing up some, I mean, I, from what I understand, talking to people who have climbed there significantly longer than I have, or either of us have, uh, pretty much anything you see there has been climbed on and it's just safe to assume that. So uh, we're definitely not going to claim any like weird first descents or anything like no. that, but n there was no chalk marks. There was no indication of any route. We just saw a line and we just followed that line until we didn't want to follow that line anymore. And it was just very sort of adventurous climbing. Yeah. I think. And I, I think that's one thing that, you know, I like climbing with you is, uh, we find some crazy lines. Yeah, I mean, they're just, people get so bogged down and that there have to be rules when you go outside and you have to follow the rules. And if you don't follow the rules, you're not actually climbing. That is just not the case. Climbing can be whatever you want. Yeah. You can just go out and just, just start climbing and just see where it takes you. That's the beauty of it. You know, maybe that's the Chris Sharma study in me, uh, but you know, I don't think that you got to follow all these rules to go out there and consider yourself a climber. Yeah, I mean, sure, if you're climbing something that's already established, follow that route yeah. that's been established. But if you're climbing something that you don't know anything about, there's no indication that people have climbed it, you can't find any beta on it, just do whatever you want. Yeah, I, I, think there. there's, I think there's a beauty in the simplicity of looking at, you know, bl like practically blank rock and saying... I want to, you know, I, I see this, you know, crazy move in there. Uh, I think one the first, the first route I set outside, the first line I ever found, it was literally because it started um, on a mon mono pocket and a crimp. Yeah. You know, doesn't get worse than that. No, no. <laughs> I mean, That's a pretty deadly combo. Yeah. For the old pulley. <laughs> but but you look at it, I mean, you've climbed it. El Primero is a beautiful line that, it's just on a blank section. Yeah, it's got a like a lot of like crossover hands, really high feet, beautiful heel hooks. So this the movement of it is just very fluid. And that's what I like. I pumpy, love pumpy, gritty, very fluid climbs. Absolutely. Yeah, it really is just when you climb it, it's just there's no rhyme or reason to it. You just it's just fun. Yeah, yeah it's just a whole lot of fun to climb on. Yeah, I, th I think that whole basin like we've we've talked about it on the show before uh so if anyone ever wants to climb go to king creek uh hit us up we'll be glad to show you the lines that we found uh we have el primero and uh do you want to give the name of the second oh, grande butthole yeah uh we, we're pretty immature so uh, yeah <laughs> We know who we are. We, we, we don't have any illusions. No, I'm going to shy away from that. We call it El Grande Butthole because, you know, why not? Um, and, uh, it, yeah, it's also, it's a it's actually a harder line, and it gets, it's pretty, it's kind of traversy, but it's mostly just um, really difficult, long, crimpy moves um, to this sort of natural ending uh, small roof section. Uh, there's also... You know, going there and, and not knowing really anything about trad, um, I think there's a lot of trad potential there. And so if any of you are just trad freaks and you're looking to put up maybe a first ascent, you should check out the Cane Creek Basin because the, the waterfall sits at, I believe, 80 feet, and the basin goes up probably another 80 feet above that. So you're looking at probably close to 140, 160 feet of climbing, of sheer climbing, blocky sandstone that looks like decent gear placement if you clean up the lines a lot and it's pretty chossy guys <laughs> oh way wow way to shout out to us yeah shout out to myself it's super chossy uh but you know gotta clean it up but yeah i think if you're really in a trad and you want to like have some adventure and put some first ascents uh, and have some fun that, that could be a place to do it i think we need to take christy and andrew down there oh definitely you know, uh, christy and andrew would love that place yeah get their trad right <clears throat> 
Yeah, exactly. Rather than teach us in an area and yeah. first. Yeah, exactly. Show it. Show us the ropes, if you will. Yeah, but I, <laughs> I know. I know. I had to say, come on, you can't. You can't hold back the comedy. Listen, puns <laughs> are my thing. Back off. All right. All right. Yep. You own no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> But no, uh, yeah, no, I think we should take them down there, uh, have them teach us some, uh, try down, uh, down in that basin, uh, you know, shout out to Christy Yates for following the Instagram. Yeah, yeah, she followed literally like right before we started podcasting. And Christy is my assistant coach on the uh, USA team at the Ascent. She's awesome. She's absolutely incredible what she yeah. does. And they run the Mathnasium. So um, if any of you guys have kids who are looking to get improve their math skills, uh, Christy and, and Andrew. In the Murfreesboro area. Yes, in the Riversboro area, Christy and Andrew Yates run a mathnasium, and they do an excellent job at it. Um, and you also get a free membership if you uh, go to the mathnasium. You get a free membership at the Ascent. Is it if you go or is it if you work there? Uh, I think it's if it's if you work there. Yeah, it's if you work which, there. which I like. You know, mm -hmm. the fact because I've seen like I've met some of the people that work with them, and they're you know bringing you know younger like a younger generation into it too like yeah and these kids. really good kids who help tutor math and they they do an excellent job of of um really just uh instructing people in the intellectual field and the school sphere and then they come into rock climbing with a very healthy humble mindset and christy yeah. and andrew are some of the best people i've met oh yeah no, awesome climbers yeah and just people in general and um and Christy's also she's also big into riding horses. I feel like I'm just uh, talking about Christy. Man, this is like this is like an awesome like female like trad oriented episode. Yeah, Christy's yeah. like the only female trad climber I know, and she crushes everything she climbs. So yeah, well, and I, and I think it goes. Uh, you know, you you've told me multiple times that you've had some questions on uh coming at your way through from your usa team where they're asking you know why aren't there more women on the team yeah yeah I, yeah yeah that's that's happened a bit um which i don't you know i don't really have a problem with be, uh, with the question itself the repeated question i do have a little bit of an issue with because um i don't choose people to join the usa team or at least to try out for the usa team based off of their gender or their sex I, I want them there based off their merit as a climber and how much they care about it and their coachability. And it, I think it's, it can be a little offensive, um, to me as a coach to suggest that I would, that I would pick someone just because they're a woman. Yeah. I do pick women to join the USA team and it is because they are good climbers. They are kind people who are coachable and love to learn and love the sport. Uh, Christy is the best example of that. Yeah, that exactly. And, and I think this episode <clears throat> itself goes to show that, you know, there there are women climbers who are crushers. And I think, yeah. you know, just the fact that it can be suggested that, you know, climbing is a male sport is it's just, just wrong. Yeah, yeah, it's just completely wrong. It's completely wrong, and it's a completely equal sport, too. I mean, I mean hell, look at, we just looked at, talked about Lynn Hill, you know, free climbing, being the first person to free climb the nose. Yep. Yeah. Uh, ever. Was it the nose? Yeah. Yeah, it was the nose. Yep. Yeah. Ever. First person to free climb the nose ever. Twice. Yep. Back to back. She did it twice. The only other person who's done it twice is Tommy Caldwell. Yeah. And we all know who he is. Yeah. Or at least, you know, if you don't, you should look him up. There's a great film about him called The Dawn Wall. Yeah. So yeah I mean, good. he is a crazy climber. Yeah. yeah. And then Margot Hayes, you know, I mean, she, you know, we've talked about her in previous episodes. She's, you know, climbed 515A, I think 515B. You know, there's. <laughs> There's only so many of those routes in the world that people have ever climbed, so she is absolutely crushing it, and she's doing it in a way that no one has ever done it before. You got Nina Williams, <clears throat> you know, free, yeah. free soloing. Mm -hmm. uh, Kira Condry got, uh, you know, onto the USA Olympic team, which, yep. shout out to all the USA climbing team uh, for the Olympics. Uh, we're going to be supporting you and watching you. Yep, yeah. Shout out to Ashima. You were so close, but you'll get him yeah. next time. So close. Yeah. yeah. We're proud of you, though. Yes, you did a good job. I, I mean, I'm proud of anyone that gets even just with, you know, that close to it. Absolutely. I mean, that is just a tremendous... And especially with the way the format is this year and how they're putting uh, as much weight on speed climbing as Boulder and Sport, which mm -hmm. I think is unfair to a lot of people who have dedicated their lives to climbing. Yeah. To all of a sudden now they have to, like, learn this, this repetitious thing in order to be considered an Olympian. Uh, yeah, I... 
I, I think that, and, and, and the format has changed. It's going to change for 2024, um, where I think they're going to score it individually um, because it got so much pushback for scoring speed, sport, and boulder, uh, how they're going to do it as, as equal parts um, based off of your placement for yeah. 2020. Um, so that's already gotten a ton of pushback, and that's changing. But congrats to the USA qualifiers. You know, you done good. <clears throat> yeah. And way to go, um, Andra, as well. You finally made it, buddy. Yeah. <laughs> I know we talked about that, you know, a, a couple episodes ago. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. He, well, he finally did it. So quick update on Andra. Yep. You did it, bud. So let's see how you do at the Olympics and see how that pressure no, I th- shakes out. I, I think coming out of our gym, though, going back, you know, circling back around to like, you know, uh, that uh, one of the climbers from my middle school, high school team that I'm the co-coach of, you know, I, I'm really proud of the fact that, you know, she, uh, she won the finals for bouldering mm-hmm. this year. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, you actually extend the offer of trial for her. Yeah, absolutely. She has, she's super qualified. She's actually better than almost every single person on my team. Um, except for one boy who's, who's older, uh, a few years older, and he's actually not going to be competing um, for sports season coming up. So it's, it's, yeah, I think it's going to be her show. I'm really looking forward to seeing what she does. Um, and she's trying out, uh, next week as well for USA. We have regionals this weekend here in Murfreesboro at Climb Murph. Um, so <clears throat> this, uh, this episode will be out, uh, long after that. Oh, maybe has, not. Has, well, maybe not. Because, but. because I mean, if, you know, I don't have to edit it down, I'm just going to throw it up there. That's true. The new format, we don't have to do as much editing. So yeah. Thank goodness. But um, if, it, if it is out, it will be out the day before. And uh, if you get a chance to listen to this or watch this podcast, and if it's out the day before, you should come by and support. Um, if not, uh, Climb Murfreesboro does host USA competitions regularly, and I'm sure they will be hosting. They haven't really scheduled, but I'm sure they will be hosting some for the sports season. Oh, yeah. No, I guarantee you. Uh, I think they're trying to move out of using Climb Nashville near as much. Uh, yeah, I mean, Climb Irv is such a it's such a new gym, and they've got such big walls and a lot of potential there, and a lot of space too. They got a lot of space to host. Well, one of the, one of the things I noticed about it, um, <clears throat> compare uh, comparing uh, both the locations, you know, Climb Nashville and Climb Murfreesboro. You go into Climb Nashville West, and it's kind of dark in there. It is like you surprisingly. can yeah. But uh, going into Climb uh, Murfreesboro, it, like they have a whole glass front, so like everything is like really bright and well lit. And I think uh, talking to some of the setters and workers from Climb Murfreesboro right before it opened, I th- want to say they spent about three hundred thousand dollars on this facility. Yeah, it's it is a really nice facility. It's beautiful, it's huge. It's it's massive, and uh, I. It, they have not hosted a sports season yet, uh, so um, they well, they hosted. Uh, maybe that was before I was I was coach. They, they, well, they hosted um, USA Collegiate Nationals. Ah, that's right. Yes, they did. Yep. Yeah. They yeah. Hosted USA Collegiate. I coach USA Youth, um, and and we'll probably start coaching USA Collegiate at the Ascent as well. So if you're a college student, we'll be offering some coaching at the Ascent soon. Yes. Um, but they did. They did host Collegiate Nationals there, and. Um, I'm sure they'll be hosting plenty of competitions in the upcoming sports season, and they're hosting bouldering regionals for youth this weekend, uh, December 14th and 15th. Yes. And um, did our gym announce about, uh, are, we, are we still opening special for people to come? We are. Come up? Yep, 6 a.m. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We'll be open at 6 a.m. Isolation for that competition starts, it opens up at 7 a.m., so we'll be open an hour before isolation opens for anybody who wants to warm up on bouldering. Which will also be really cool for um, the people that are in the later sessions because they yes. can come and train. And yeah, because we'll up. be open from 6 till our normal starting time. Yes. Um, so we're basically going to be open from 6 till 10 p.m., 6 a.m. till 10 p.m. that whole day. So it's going to be uh, available for people to come in and warm up and train and get loose and maybe even warm down after the competition's over. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> we got a nice new setup uh, from our um, youth league finals that happened this past weekend. Oh, an amazing set! Yeah, great. We got thirty nine rounds up on the boulder. It's awesome. I might be a little biased because, you know, we we said it. <laughs> yeah, you know, but... yeah, totally. I mean, we we definitely have a little bias there, but I gotta tell you, it's a good set. 
Oh yeah, no, we, we, we definitely have some fun climbs. Uh, I think one of my favorite climbs is the one that me and you actually said that's uh it's, it's a very slopey has like the iron cross with the meat hook. Yeah. That thing. Yeah. It's like a V six. It's, it's, it's not that many moves, but it is pretty gnarly. Yeah. I mean, you want to talk about something that's really slopey and rough. It's slopey on a yeah. slide overhang. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, I, th I think we're the actual devil. Yeah. I, yeah, we could be. I mean, I definitely, I was actually judging, uh, the hardest high school finals, um, route. And I had one of the climbers just call me a sadist like three or four times in the span of four minutes while he was supposed to be climbing. He just kept turning around and calling me a sadist. Cause he knew that I said, it. I didn't even tell him that I said it. He was just like, yep, I know it's you. And I did. I said it. Yeah. That was me. <clears throat> I, I think one of the funniest things I heard from finals, cause I actually didn't get to watch much of it because I was back in isolation, uh, getting, uh, the climbers ready to come out. And, uh, I heard that one of the kids, gets to middle it was middle school three mm -hmm. and they turn around they look at it and they just say you've got to be kidding me yeah yeah no that yeah i witnessed that it was hilarious he was just waiting 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 as soon as the buzzer went off he turns around first thing it was most oh you got to be kidding me you know just this sunken face like oh god this sucks you know yeah but when he saw it he when he turned around and saw the third high school route he turned around he didn't realize what he was that he was climbing and then He's like, well, which one is it? And I pointed to him. He was like, oh, oh and he just looks so defeated. Minute, that was that was the uh, high school one, wasn't it? What, wasn't that uh, Natalie's brother? Yes. Yeah. So that was high school. Uh, yeah. I think. No, it was. It was also Natalie's brother who said, "You've got to be kidding me." Oh, right. Yep. Yeah, because he was on high school too. Gotcha. And he said that. Yeah, that was pretty funny. Um, so yeah, we're we're really looking forward to uh, people telling us what they think about the set. Um, our last one got a lot of good feedback. I'm actually more proud of this one than the last one, which I thought was going to be really hard to do. You know, we, we had to uh, stack a lot of stuff together because we had to have so much open space for the final format. Um, and we can only set that final format between the end of the regular competition in the morning and the finals in the evening. So we had, a, we had like an hour and a half window after the elementary competition ended to put up six finals routes. But I, but I think overall, you know, we made it work in such a way that we really put our heart and soul into doing this final set because we wanted this final competition of the season to be one of the best. Yeah, you know, it's so it's so interesting being in the climbing world and, and being just enthralled and consumed every day. You and I both are so obsessed with outdoor climbing and outdoor culture, and yet we spend a lot of time in the gym engaging with gym culture and being a part of it um and while i can say plenty of negative things about gym culture i can also say plenty of positives and um setting for these competitions is so much fun oh man i just i love it you just can take inspiration from outdoor climbs and just vomit it back up on the wall yep. in such a weird way uh that it just it just makes you better I don't know, as a, as a climber and as a person, it's just a lot of fun. Yeah, and I, and I think I, I enjoy seeing the kids get excited about seeing the sets and, you know, the first time they get to see it fully completed 100% and they're looking around and they're giving their assessments before they even jump on the wall. Like, I had one of, one of the kids from our uh, middle school, high school, uh, she looked at it and she goes, I think you all made these two way too easy. And I think I'm like, we only had 33 climbs and she was like, I, I think I could get on 32. Yeah. And uh, I think she put a couple of attempts on it and I think it still shut her down because it was like still a six, but you know. Yeah. No, 32 was like, it was a borderline V7. Yeah. yeah. It's hard. It's really hard. I haven't even jumped on it yet. Yeah. Well, I, I, I can't, I haven't stuck the, I can stick the last move. I have not stuck it yet. I need to, br I need to brush that last crimp. It's so greasy. Gotcha. <laughs> yeah. It's pretty, and it's tiny too. It's like a micro crimp. Just yeah. a complete razor. Yeah. But overall, I think, I think we had a great season. I think we ended very strong. And I think we got a lot of, you know, we had kids that had a lot of fun and are going to want to come back. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of diversity among the climbs, and I think it's going to really engage the community that's at the ascent, and hopefully bring in some climbers from kind of all over to just to just get on some really cool stuff and maybe you know get some motivation, get the stoke back. Yeah, and, definitely. Yeah. That that's one thing that me and you really were 100 percent about is bringing that stoke back. You know. 
um, I, I think it would, I think it's going to be a cool thing if we can get like actual training sessions going that we can invite people into. Yeah. Totally. Um, I started uh, yesterday, actually. We had a couple new families come into the gym because um, every Sunday we offer a family day mm -hmm. that was literally just like um, anyone that's listening uh, on Sundays, you can come to the Ascent with your full family, full household for $39.99, $42.80, tax yeah. and all, year included. Yeah, no matter how many people you have in your family. Yeah, as long as you all live in the same household. Yep. Yeah. And uh, these people, uh, both families, just really seem to enjoy and get into it. And I encourage them to come back, you know, on Sundays. But I, I also threw out, uh, you know, our membership to them because I want to get new people constantly into it. And with our membership, you know, we have uh, the challenge that people can come to, which is climbing for adults. Mm -hmm. I think it's, you know, a really, a really great program that, um, you know, it, it, it takes away or it doesn't take away from anything, but it, it adds to it as a way of saying, Hey, your kid or you, your kids are coming here to be a part of our leagues. This is for you. So you can get some training and have some fun and meet some of the other people in our community. Yeah. And you don't have to worry about your kids climbing experience because it's, it's late at night and it's other adults there who are in the same boat. And you know, it's also like you and I are there and we don't have kids and we're just there to just go climb and just hang out with other adults and, and have, you know, discussions about climbing with them and just... I think it's a very open format. Yeah. But then at the same time, I'm looking at it and say, and while you all are doing that, you can get your kids involved in the youth program, rec leagues, mm -hmm. kids rock, you know, shout out to Haley Casey for running, you know, getting young kids introduced to the sport at an early age. And Oh man, Haley is just so good at what she does and just such a vibrant person to be around if you guys ever have the pleasure of hanging around Haley Casey you are a lucky person yes because she's she is phenomenal at at what she at like, what she does and who she is yeah not only does <clears throat> does she come into the gym and she fosters this you know enthusiasm with the kids uh she runs her own business in her spare time she makes custom bags so shout out to bangerang bags check them out on uh, instagram yeah she does she does really excellent chalk bags you can just hand her a design and she will draw it up and create it and make a chalk bag out of it i've yeah. seen her do it it's awesome they turn the, out really the very well. first chalk bag i ever bought was one of hers and it really was, uh, it was a custom bag that she made that has a it had a bunch of like marvel comic panels that's so cool yeah yeah I recently saw one from our friend uh, Trinity who climbs at the Ascent. She got a bag from Haley, and I think it had some sort of like starry night sky space oh, theme. It, really was, cool. it was really like, it yeah. turned out excellent. So, yeah. so if you want something that's you know not exactly what you can find online, definitely give Haley Casey a shout out. Yeah, absolutely. Or if you're looking for a gift, we're coming up in the Christmas season. If you're looking for a gift for a, another climber, and you're just looking for something special, custom that wasn't bought at you know, just a, a another REI. big store, yeah, at REI or just you know just another online forum, and you want something handmade. Man, Haley makes excellent chalk bags. Does she make chalk pots as well? I don't think she makes chalk pots. Yeah, I, I think she sticks with the bags, but I'm um, sure if you pay her enough, she'll make a chalk pot. Oh yeah, <laughs> I'm sure I'm sure she'll work with you. Like she yeah. she likes working with people and getting them what they want, and what they need. Yeah. Uh, but also, if you're looking for a great gift, the Ascent right now is offering um, these like boulder deals. It's a uh, yeah. it's a chalk pot. Um, it's a brush. AB Plus, I think, is the brand of the brush. Uh, the yeah, the AB Plus Wazzle brush. Organic bag, either an organic uh, boulder pot or a AB Plus or Bangarang chalk bag. So one of mm -hmm. Haley's bags, or not the custom bags, but one that she has already made up. And then it's a five ounce bag, uh, Friction Labs. Is that correct? I believe it's five, five or ten ounce. Yep. Yeah. Uh, I think it's the ten ounce. Yeah, ten ounce bag, Friction Labs. I'm not sure which. Uh, you you can get either the Unicorn Dust, the Bam Bam, or the Gorilla Grip. Yeah. Yeah. And it's one of the smaller bags. Uh, so that's a five ounce. Yeah. Yeah. So five ounce bag. Yeah. Which is actually quite a bit of chalk. Um, yeah. I recently just purchased one of those, and I mean. Oh yeah, Friction Labs is great. It's like, gonna yeah. last for forever. Yeah, yeah. yeah, Friction Labs does. They do a really good job of, of making their chalk. It it just stays on your hands a lot longer. 
But yeah, we we, we have those uh, deals going on right now. You can get all three of those things for fifty five bucks. Yeah, totally. Yep. It's yeah, it's a it's a, it's a really good uh, gift for Christmas for especially for um, people who are trying to get into climbing and into bouldering specifically. Mm -hmm. It's a really good. It's a really good gift, and it's not that expensive. Yeah. So let's talk. Let's shift gears a little bit here. Let's talk a little bit about partnerships. Um, this kind of this idea of talking about what a partnership means and what a partnership is for you uh, and what it's supposed to do for you, the pros and cons of it, came from that Rock and Ice interview with Hazel Finley uh, and a question that they asked her about choosing a partner for um, uh, her climb, and which was that, that uh, test piece. And the general premise of of talking about these partnerships is well what benefit or I guess what pro and what con comes from from your partner and how do you choose that and I know I can speak for me personally I've had, I've had multiple climbing partners uh, most notably is Joseph McDonald um, and you and it I think both of those partnerships interact with my personality in very different ways so what what kind of what kind of partnerships have you have you had and what have they what have they contributed or not contributed so uh one of one of my first climbing partnerships uh was <coughs> when i first got into climbing i didn't really know much about it um and i've talked about this a little bit uh you know i wanted to get in i, I was constantly in the gym and one of the people that was a familiar face that was constantly in there uh his name was uh andrew i want to say his last name was andrew lewis mm. or his full name was andrew lewis mm. um but you know he, he was a great guy one of the most energetic people i've ever met like coming through the gym mm. like even if he was having a crappy day he was just there. stoked you know? yeah, yeah yeah he was there to motivate right and well you know i don't i don't necessarily know you know what his uh, ability level for climbing was mm -hmm. I know that for me every time I was climbing with him he made me want to climb harder he would encourage yep. me to jump on stuff even if I wasn't climbing, like you know if there was a V4 even though I was climbing V0s and V1s he would encourage he'd be like yo why don't you just try it out you, like, right. you got this you don't have to finish it just try it right you know and, and that's one thing that really stuck with me is um, encouraging the other people around you to try stuff. So let me push you on that a little bit and ask, you know, so so the basic idea of, of your first partner was that motivation aspect. Mm -hmm. We all change as we climb and we get older and we spend more time on the wall and on the rock. We get into ice, alpinism, whatever it is you're into, we all change about what we're looking for. So what are you looking for now? What's what's changing from that first partner? What what has changed and what is changing for you now? What are you looking for more of? Um, I mean, I feel like you know, for everyone, the stoke and maintaining that is always a big part of it. I I think uh, <clears throat> being, uh, being enthusiastic and supportive is going to always, to me, be a hundred percent the best way to go mm -hmm. to be a climbing partner with me. Mm -hmm. I really. You know, just my personality type, I respond well to that. Yeah. You know, you encourage me, I'll encourage you. Mm -hmm. And I like, I think that's one thing that me and you have really, you know, come to terms with in, yeah. in our climbing is we try to push each other. We, we want to make sure that each other is getting their projects, getting something they're trying and trying to stay as positive about it as possible. Right. Everyone has bad days. That doesn't, you know... You know, that doesn't always translate well when you're gym climbing because you can have a bad day and come in and still be, you know, have a bad headspace for it. Yeah. But as long as, you know, you're being a good climbing partner and motivating, then that doesn't affect you as much. Yeah. And yeah. I, I say after that, um, the second thing is just I want a climbing partner that at the end of the day I can hang out with away from climbing. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I want a climbing partner that I can start a climbing podcast with. Yeah, you know, totally. Someone I can go have a beer with, play some pool with, mm -hmm. you know, unwind for the day and just, you know, forget about things. Yeah, absolutely. 
Yeah. And that's, and that's really, that's a really important thing to, to have in a partner. Um, and I, I'm sure there's some of your viewers who have had partners or maybe you're looking for a climbing partner and this is just some food for thought, some stuff to think about, you know, be careful who you choose in partners, I think. Not necessarily on a, on a dangerous level, like, hey, you know, be wary, but be careful. Make sure that there's somebody that you want to be around, you know I mean? They need to be, they need to be a friend, but they need to be someone that's going to push you. Yeah. <clears throat> I know for me personally, you know, I, one of the, one of the best things that, that you and I have going is that stoke and keeping that stoke up. And it has been, uh, an excellent force, just, just vibing while we train and while we climb. Um, and Joe and I have been partners now for yeah, six years coming up on seven, maybe long time. And for the majority of my climbing career, I'd say Joe and I have been partners. And one thing that Joe does really well is he he keeps me within the margin of safety. Because um, he has a tendency, as I have a tendency with him, to we can really amp each other up <laughs> till we end in a certain uh, dangerous situation. Um, but at the end of the day, I always know that if it's getting too hairy carry out there, Joe's going to dial me back in and I'll do the same for him. Um, and that's, that's another thing to think about as, uh, when you're thinking about your climbing partner is, is it someone who can really, really push you, but always keeps you within, uh, a love within the safety margin, yeah. within the line of climbing on the side that, that airs on the side of life and doesn't, doesn't ever cross that line. That they're always they're always aware of what you're capable of doing and as a team, um, and what you can and cannot execute and or get away with, um, and but you know just keeps pushing you there, keeps the stoke up, you know, keeps it light, keeps it happy, but you know, yeah, maintains that safety level. That's important. Yes, I know the last podcast we had was super heavy, talking about safety, you know, and yeah. um, I think that there are climbers who have died. Who, if they'd had a partner who was a little more aware and was not afraid to say this, this needs to change. We're doing something that um, is a stupid, reckless thing to do. Um, you know, then they, those climbers would still be alive. Yeah. And then I think the final thing for me is also it, or is going to be uh, I want a partner who shares a sense of adventure. Absolutely. You know. Um, <clears throat> I don't think they're a partner if they don't. Yeah, I mean, well, what I'm saying is, I, I don't want to go to LRC, Rock Town, uh, Short Mountain, Kings Bluff, and cl I, I don't want to go there and climb the exact same climb the exact same way 15, 20 times. Repeats. Yes. Day in, like, day out. I mean, yeah, I mean, I know plenty of people, just they just mm -hmm. live for repeats. Yeah, because they think it looks cool. They they know yeah. they know the moves. They're, yeah. And you know they're you know getting people to watch them because they know they think it looks cool. I I'm all for redoing projects, mm -hmm. like getting on projects constantly when you're going because I think that's how you finish a project is absolutely you know, to do it. But once that project's done, move on. Move on. I mean, at least give it five or ten years. Then come back and say, <laughs> "Yeah, oh, I want to try that again." Yeah, yeah. If you're feeling, if you're feeling the spot, uh, yeah. well, maybe I'll, yeah, you know, nostalgia. Just, yeah, this was fun to get on. That could be fun to get on again. I'll probably hate my life, but whatever. We'll go with it. Yeah. So you know, I I think a good partner is going to be one that shares the. I I mean, and maybe you're like if a person is that way and they want to get on that, they they need to find a partner that thinks the same way. Yeah, totally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You don't want someone who's polar opposites. That's for sure. You definitely don't want someone who's like blasting music at the crag, and you're trying to commune with a butterfly. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you want someone who's like on your level, who's not going to disrupt your experience. Because when you go outside, it's an experience. You know, it's not a workout. It's an experience. You go out there. I mean, I, I guess for some people it is a workout. You know, I know when Hanel was training for that solo, he was he was effectively working out in the mountains to become fitter in order to climb that effectively, that free rider route. Yeah. But you know, it's the majority of the time. I think climbing outside is really just about you know your experience, your partner's experience in the outdoors. You want to have someone who's on the same wavelength. Yeah. You know, and uh, I've seen plenty of 
quote unquote partnerships go down where it's two people are very, very different in their approaches. Um, yeah. And that doesn't last. There's just no point in starting something that's not going to last like that. You know, climate partners are supposed to be long term. I Choose mean, your partners carefully. I, th I think if you're going to pick a, a climbing partner, it, it's got to be someone that, you know, uh, <clears throat> in the end, you're going to think of them as family. Mm -hmm. it's, it's got to be someone that you trust with everything. Absolutely. Because if you're going up, you know, L cap, you know, climbing 30 something pitches, 30, I think it's what, 32, 33 pitches. Yeah. I think you're like getting the nail on the head there. Like when, when you get up, you don't want someone that you don't fully trust on the 18th or 19th pitch, which, and, which can be bridged into a discussion about picking your mentor as well. Uh, we were talking about that earlier today and what it means to have a mentor and how to choose one. Um, and I think a lot, <laughs> I think if you're going to choose a mentor, you need to make it clear to them that you think of them that way. Because when you have a mentor, you give them your trust. If they don't know that you're giving them 100% of your trust, that can cause some challenges along the way. People need to be aware of how you think about them, I think. And I, I think it comes down to if, if you're going to choose a person to be your mentor and say, and, and you're going to say, yes, I want you to be my mentor, then it, it, there comes with a little bit of, you know, a respect issue. Like, Absolutely. You, you like, uh, you, you have to respect them enough that you're going to follow kind of what they say and, you know, go on. And, and, and then you get into like the terminology, like just because someone knows more than you and you're wanting to learn from them doesn't necessarily mean they have to be your mentor. Absolutely. It, you know, it doesn't, you know, I got a guy, uh, a friend, I was a mutual friend of ours, Jeremy King. Shout out to Jeremy. He's kind of a, an OG guy around here in Murfreesboro, mm -hmm. big mountain biking. He's been really big in the climbing scene as well. Just sort of a, a true outdoorsman. And he was really the person that I first considered a mentor in the sport of climbing. And he probably hasn't lead anybody in a while, like years. And if he walked up to me tomorrow and said, I got you on this lead route, I would climb it with zero question about his ability to catch me. Yeah. I just would, I, you know, because I, I thought of him as a mentor and I really thought about him in, in the regard of if this guy tells me that something's good, I'm going to trust him that it's mm -hmm. good. If he tells me that something's too sketch, I'm going to back off because I, I have faith in him. But then that's like, uh, you know, you've been climbing significantly longer than me. Mm -hmm. And I know there's a lot I can learn from you, mm -hmm. but I don't consider you my mentor. Right. Like, you know, I, I mean, I trust you with my life. And right. I, you're my climbing partner. But, you know, I would never say, you know, I'm, I would never put on to you like, hey, I am your responsibility. You need right. to teach me everything you know. Right. And that's where the danger can come in. Exactly. Is when people start saying, well, it's when people start acting like you're responsible for their life without having developed a connection with you. Mm -hmm. And that takes time. Yeah. You know, I, it took years. It took years before I thought of Jeremy that way. And, um, you know, when I was younger and I was a lot more malleable and I was a lot more willing to trust him, but it still took a while before I really, really trusted him. Yeah. And it, it even took a step back into college where I went away to college and I came back and I was like, man, this guy's just, he just never let me down. And I just, I trust him fully. He's, he has always been uh, a standard for me to hold myself to. Mm -hmm. And people overlook that. They just brush past it. Ah, I'm a mentor. Ah, I'm a mentor, you know? Yeah. Well... I don't know. You might want to pause and think about that. Yeah, I, I think that's a uh, heavy statement. <laughs> I think looking for a mentor and asking someone to be your mentor is one of those things that it, it just it really shouldn't be entered into lightly. It should not because, and and I'll tell you another reason. I've had it. I've experienced someone look me look at me as a mentor and then have had a have had a falling out with them, and that can be really bad on their mental health too and even if you have a falling out you don't want someone to screw up yeah you know big time and i felt terrible about that because while i didn't really want to spend any more time around him or climb around him uh and i was losing respect for him i still didn't wish wish him ill no and i could see that it it hurt him to have 
uh, that mentor-mentee relationship broken apart because he put a lot of faith and trust in me. And I'm not saying it was my fault or anything. You know, I'm not saying it was his fault either. It just it fell apart. Um, relationships do. But he was broken by that for a while, I think. And I don't know, it kind of messed my head up too, you know. I was, yeah. you know, I he he told me he looked at me that way, and I I did also kind of see myself as his mentor, and brought him into the climbing scene, and you know, things change, and I felt kind of bad, and I thought, you know, maybe I'm, shoot, maybe I'm not so good at this, and maybe I'm just way too young, and you know, I took a I took a big step back from teaching anybody anything about climbing. I was like, just Joe. We'll just go and climb, and we'll just do crazy stuff as partners together. I'm not mentoring anybody for a while. And I'm still kind of in that phase, but I'm more willing to teach people about climbing. I'm just not willing to teach them about the risky aspects of it anymore. I'm just like, more like the basic techniques now. Like, uh, yeah. But I also kind of have to because I'm a coach as well. Yeah. You know, so are you. But, but that's a little <clears throat> bit different, uh, coaching a team full of people and making sure they're learning the stuff that keeps them safe versus a one-on-one mentor-mentee relationship. Absolutely. So, I don't know. That's just, uh, that's all just kind of where I stand on it. I think it's just, it's something that shouldn't be entered into lightly and it should be discussed by both parties. Um, and there needs to be, you know, boundaries set in, inside of that. Absolutely. But... Well, I mean, there should there should always be boundaries set. In, oh yeah, you know, in any climate, especially in in, mentors, in mentorships and in partnerships, boundaries have to be set. Mm-hmm. And if they're not, you know, like everything in climbing, it can go sour quickly. Yes, <clears throat> and that's just people take this people take this stuff too lightly. Take it seriously. Yeah, take climbing is seriously. a very serious sport. Yeah, like yeah. I mean, it's uh, it's fun. It's so much fun. It's an amazing life experience, but it is also. In climbing, there is a very thin line between life and death. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And it, it can be as something as simple as going up something super sketch, not checking your backup, or you know, even going up in the wrong headspace. Yeah, going around having bad spotters on a sketchy boulder with a bad landing. You know, it's just like things can just go bad on the, in the simplest of ways, and. The further you get into climbing and the further you push that, the more and more dangerous it gets. You get mm-hmm. on Conrad Anchor level, it's just like, man, you have to be so careful. And dialed in. And dialed in. And even then, you may not make it because there's stuff that happens completely outside of your control. Yeah, nature. Nature. Yeah, is, nature happens. It is the pe- most powerful like force on this earth. Yeah, totally. Right. Yeah. You can't stop it. You, know, you yeah. can't stop an avalanche. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. No matter how much you want to. Yeah, yeah. If you survive an avalanche, you got lucky. Yeah. It's not because you did anything. You just, you just got lucky. No. Yeah. yeah. Or, you know, depending on whatever your faith is. You know. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, me and you have talked, I'm a fairly yeah. religious person, so yeah. I do believe in a higher power, you yeah. know, watching out after me. Yeah, and for me, it's just chance. <laughs> Which I feel like, you know, it's just the motto of my, well, he really got out of that just by chance. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's kind of how it seems too in the moment. That's why I'm like, I don't know, maybe it is just chance. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I, I look at it as you know, I've got some guardian angel following me around, going, "You dumbass, stay out of there, <laughs> get away from here." Yeah, yeah, you know, kept putting their arm around me and guiding me away from it. Yeah, totally. The voice in the back of your head. Yeah, mm, might not be a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> You ever been up to the Sewanee? You ever heard of the Sewanee Angel? Mm-hmm. You know the the school up on Mount Eagle Mountain where Foster Falls mm-hmm. is. Yeah. Yeah. When you go on campus, there's a lore that every every person who lives on campus, all, all the students have their own like guardian angel, and like when you when you cross the boundary of campus, you like tap the roof of your car to collect your angel, and when you leave campus, you tap the roof of your car to release your angel. That's like the lore. Hmm. Um, which is kind of cool. There's been there's been people on you know there's a I, I went to a science camp there when I was in high school, and my roommate was a Wesley Duke maybe Wesley something I can't remember his last it was a long time ago, it was like eight years ago, and uh, maybe more. And he came from that. He came from a family that was very heavily ingrained in both. I think both of his parents were professors. His grand, his grandfather was like a dean, or godfather was a dean. And his, I think it was his dad was hiking on campus. It's, it's the second largest college campus in the, in the world. 
uh, for, for those of you who don't know anything about Salonix, 13,000 acres. I the, didn't know that. The largest campus in the world is in Georgia, and that is 26,000 acres. It's double the size of Salonix. Wow. So Salonix has a lot of natural territory. It's got a lot of valleys and bluffs and all sorts of stuff. And there's this natural stone bridge that's way out in the middle of, you know, the some, some valley. I think it's in Shaker Ag or something like that. And... Um, I think it was his dad, he like fell us like 25 feet off this bridge on jagged rock. Not not a scratch on him, wow. just a couple bruises. That's insane. No broken bones. That is very insane. That's yep. awesome. Yeah, pretty crazy. So that's actually, it's a huge lore on, on campus. And I mean, I don't, you know, I'm not religious at all. Even when I enter Sewanee, I tap the roof of my car. You know, it's just, it's just ritual. You just do yeah. it, you know. You know, so. it never hurts to have something else on your side. Yeah, it's, I mean, it, it, it doesn't affect me to tap the roof of my car, so, you know. Yeah, but it might save your life. But it might save my life, you yeah. know. What do I know? Well, <laughs> you know, I, I think it's about time that we uh, start wrapping this thing up. Yeah, totally. So, uh, well, um, we've got regionals this weekend, so wish us luck. Um, we've got, let's see, I think I've got 10, 10 USA competitors for the Ascent that will be there. Um, we're a decent-sized team. Hopefully, hopefully we'll put up a good showing. Uh, if any of them qualify in the top 10, they go to divisionals. That's in Florida. Um, and if, and then if I get to go to divisionals in Florida, that's like the weekend before year A. Yeah. So it'll be beach mountains. Okay. What a life to live. <laughs> Doesn't get better than that. Yeah. What a life to live. So coming at you, Jossie conversations from our small homie closet. I'm, I'm Rhett Lundy, your I'm, host. And I'm Logan McGahat. All right. Signing off.